Today we have a number of hosts uh, or guests that have joined us from all over the world. We've got people from Auckland, we've got people from Alaska, the Yukon, Vancouver Island, Bern, Switzerland. So it's just fantastic to see a bunch of people interested in this topic. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for joining. I met Annie some, what, six months ago, and I think you had just gotten off your Iceland boat. Is that right, Annie? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you were nervously putting your film together. And I tell you, I probably watched this uh, preview, I would say at least 20 times. And <laughs> it was so soothing to me, the first part. It has really inspired me as a boater to be much more aware of what I am doing in my environment, not just for the sound I'm creating, but for all the other things I'm doing to disturb the ocean. And so uh, you were part of that uh, inspiration. So thank you very much, uh, Annie. Well, I first studied humpbacks when I did my dissertation at university from a marine biology degree. And I was working with um, an acoustician, I think is how you pronounce it, um, in Paris, who was trying to break down um, the humpback call, like the frequencies that you can see, and try and look at behavior at the time and anatomy and try and piece it together and break down the subunits like a language. And one really tiny, small part of my dissertation then was about noise pollution and about how humpback acoustics are affected by that. And it was something I'd never really thought about before, as it is a thing when you mention, I'm sure all of you have found, you mention noise pollution to people and they go, wow, I never thought about that before, but it really makes sense. And that to me was like, well, if people aren't thinking about it and if it then really makes sense, then it should be something that we try and communicate a little bit more. Um, so I think for me, that's why making the film seemed to be a no brainer. I've just done a, masters in wildlife filmmaking and for that we have to make a film so it just felt like something that meant a lot to me i studied humpbacks for a while i i'm just blown away by their acoustics and even though it's the toothed whales that are probably more affected i think we're finding at the moment but i just i went for humpbacks as a main focus just because everybody listens to humpback acoustics and use it as like a, a way to relax and they're just so powerful so i think that was a really important way to say this is something that we're affecting listen to how beautiful it is why would you ever want to affect it you know annie first and, and I, I so appreciate you making that film and taking this on as one of your passions and uh, hopefully uh teaching uh, us as boaters uh that this is actually an issue because we don't even know we have no idea that um what we're doing is creating this unseen pollution and uh and, and to that point, I just want to introduce some of the other uh, panelists that we have here. Uh, so Lauren, welcome. Uh, it's good to have you here, uh, a fellow British Columbian. Yeah. yeah, well, I suppose I should also say, in case it, it confuses people, although I'm in British Columbia, I'm originally from Scotland, so the accent probably doesn't exactly jive. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's such a powerful medium to use film and to communicate something, and, and I think Annie mentioned, you know, that the situation with the noise is a lot, because you can't see it, a lot of people cannot relate to it. Um, it's an invisible pollution and, and using film as a media is a very difficult thing to, to use a visual um, technique to communicate something that you can't see. But I think it's, we as humans being visual animals really need something visual in order to get our heads around, around the problem. And I think um, that's the using a film like this is really a really neat way to do that. And Taylor, you've been patiently sitting and uh, uh, you're our guest American today. So thank you very much for joining us. But Taylor, you're actually on the front lines. Uh, you've, uh, you're the program coordinator for Soundwatch, which is doing an amazing job in one of the most heavily touristed areas of our waterways, where we've got literally thousands of boats yearly coming to look at all kinds of whale traffic. And so you're on the front lines all the time trying to manage this uh, this, this issue, and you must come across this as well. And uh, knowing now also what we do with the sound in here, this must, this must just also give you another, uh, another bit of encouragement to. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, the SoundWatch program is actually hosted through the Whale Museum that Lauren is showing off to the poster behind her. I actually have it on this wall, but um, yeah, so SoundWatch, 
you know, it's more of a play on words for the Puget Sound. We don't actually deal with too much acoustics, but what we deal with is research, management, and education for vessel traffic. Um, and, you know, I think that film was amazing and it just, you know, kind of highlighted the continued or the beginning of the education message, you know, we didn't really know about acoustic pollution, you know, 10 years ago. It's now kind of becoming this thing that's evolving that people are starting to understand and research more. So, I mean, it was, it was pretty impactful to watch. To, uh, Taylor, and we're going to get back into some other things. So what evidence do we actually have that um, human-made ocean noise is a problem? I think one of the clearest evidences we just saw on that it looks like almost a cell phone video of, in the film of dolphins driving up on the beach. I don't know if that was during some kind of acoustic disturbance, but you know, with lots of strandings, there is evidence, um, you know, behavioral and actually physiological when they do necropsies to see that there is damage to, you know, the sensory organs that deal with sound perception and hearing, and that's you know the leading cause for lots of mass strandings, especially in. Uh, the adonis eats the tooth whales. Lauren, you must you must have in in your studies and research you must have some some uh, data as well. Yeah, and sure, and and what we were talking about there, the mass strandings, that was the first I think big red flag um, that really sparked off kind of going, oh, what now is happening here? Um, and that was when we realized this, you know, more about this acute kind of noise pollution, so like use of sonar and really very very loud noises and these shock kind of um, situations that animals were finding themselves and that led to mass strandings and and really quite severe physical injuries as well uh, and then that took you know five or six years to kind of start getting a handle on what was happening there um, and then also people started to kind of realize well actually there's um, and it's just going back to something that Annie mentioned actually that we're understanding more about the different frequencies um, of noise that we emit from from activities such as vessels or from sonar they can really lead to a multitude and a, a real scale of different impacts. So we're also now only really in the last 10 years really focused on um, more chronic sources of ocean noise and actually understanding how they might um, impact marine life as well. And, and that's where the boating kind of really that falls into that bracket. You know, it's, it's constant, it's droning. Um, it's just like that buzz in the background from, you know, like compared to a very like loud blasty type noise. Um, but that also now we're, we're really getting quite strong evidence to now to look at you know how that has a multitude of impacts as well which can ultimately be fatal for some populations um, as well. So Lauren you mentioned this um, some of the sources and I think it's it's quite broad I didn't realize as well until uh, you folks highlighted it but there are a number of different sources this is just not it's just not boating but there's a number of other really major sources of, of these uh, um, uh, sonic acoustic problems if we're well first of all kind of looking at the vessel traffic when we look at more chronic noise when we look at the ocean um the, the background noise levels have, have doubled every decade for the last three or four decades um and, and you know when you look at average um across ocean basins and that's really largely attributed to increase in global shipping um it's you know quite a logical pattern when you lay the two data sets out side by side um we're importing and exporting more goods than ever um, via oceans and so that's kind of raising this background noise level up a little bit you know every every year and so that's that leads to like a whole one set of, of problems but then we have these more localized impacts um, from such things like a side, seismic surveys you know and you look at oil and gas exploration you know and, and mapping the seabed and you know for sort of for science and navigation and safety that all is done through emitting active noise input into the environment and it is very loud and um, we're, we're also put into an environment that noise, um, the way noise behaves in water is far more affected than it is in, in air uh, and we are subjecting it to animals that use hearing as their primary sense um, and and you know we we notice it first that with whales uh, and dolphins but now we're you know, a typical human being is going, oh, hang on a minute, like, oh, <laughs> everything else probably in the marine environment uses noise in some way as well. Um, and, and again, it's all kind of trickled down and we know now even down to very small organism invertebrates, you know, and how important noise is to them. Um, so yeah, we're, we're just scratching the surface and, and it's kind of that human ignorance thing that, oh, actually, we've been doing this for a while and possibly having quite large impacts. 
Well, it's interesting, Annie, the first time that I saw you on video, I think it was a promo that you were doing uh, in advance of your film. And concentration to be able to find food. <laughs> Second, a little bit of an insight, sit. but it's almost like um, when these marine mammals are deep in the water, it's dark. They can't see anything. They really navigate through sound. Uh, whales use sound as a primary sense in the ocean. If they can't, uh, if water visibility is bad and, and, and smell isn't really a sense for them, um, so much so sound and, and hearing is their, their primary sense and sound travels four times faster in the ocean. So it is just something we can't really get our heads around. So in that promo um, clip that you're talking about, and with the cymatics in the film, I just needed something to visualize this issue. And then later on when there's the archive and you can hear and, and it's, we're showing all the strandings and the guys talking, I just decided to just get rid of his voice because I thought the most important thing was just to really try and show how we're disrupting this communication because whales use it to hunt, navigate, communicate with one another and during mating sounds are so important. So if we're having an impact on almost every step of their life cycle and every part that's important and the way they function, and as Lauren said, there's so many things that use sound in the oceans, you know, reefs make sound so that fish can return back to, to breed. And it's just something that you can sit on the top of a boat and you can hear your engine, but you can't quite understand the magnitude of what effect it is having underwater. And sometimes, and I think Bruno, you used this analogy of being having your head underwater in a bathtub and knocking on the side of the bath and how loud that sound is. It's, it's the same and these whales can't escape it. And as Taylor said, you know, they've found hearing and brain trauma on these animals that have, um, have been, have beached themselves during the mass strandings. And the archive used in the film isn't definitely saying that those specific, particular individuals were stranded from that. It was more just to represent the issue itself. But um, I think when you're, on a, on mass scale driving so many individuals out of their environment and and quite often they have coincided with military testing in the area as well and and sonar practices so it's yeah i mean it, it's something that just is, is very disturbing to think we've got that effect but i i find it a rather empowering type of pollution if i'm allowed to say i um just because of that message at the end that the fact that we could get rid of it as quick as we could. Plastic is something that is going to be in our oceans for thousands and thousands of years and it'll affect generations of species. But noise pollution, I think, has a positive to it in the fact it could be gone and it wouldn't have any long lasting effects so much. Um, I want to talk about one thing that you said in the film as well, which is um, in 18 hours, all the noise would dissipate. And that's the good news. But um, there's also damage that's done. Um, I know for myself, if I, I used to go to rock concerts when I was your age and have my ear right by the speaker, but my ears are ringing for days later and it must be some of that impact as well. And it's why we would consider it pollution. And I, and I, and I don't think time as well, but distance, not just, yeah, how these animals are affected for like extended periods of time. The fact that it would take 18 hours for the sound to dissipate out and when it's trapped almost in the basin of the ocean and just like an echo in a concert hall. But, but the distance, I think, is the thing that's most shocking for me. With the seismic surveys that they do, they have a few regulations in place. For example, if they see a whale, I think this is all correct. I'm talking to scientists that are working on the forefront a bit more actively than I am at the moment. But if they see a whale within 300 meters, I think some of the figures are, they then stop, but obviously whales aren't constantly at the surface. If they hear whales on, um, when they're like just looking for them, acoustics underwater, they um, obviously whales aren't always communicating. And it's the distance and the efficiency of sound in the water that is the most important thing for me if they're running these seismic surveys up and down uh, the east coast of america in the coming years to look for oil those practices that they're going to put in place just aren't enough like to to stop when you see a whale within 300 meters will sound travels far times further for them so it's just not good enough and that's 
think it's it's not just the time that's yeah it's the distance for me that i just find quite yeah scary and daunting yeah it is and, and lauren you must um you know the work that you're doing here you must come across um all of these kinds of issues as well because we have the waterways here are full of whale but we've also got one of the busiest ports and there's been some work done with the uh, Port of Vancouver and some other people that are trying to just understand that it's even slowing down. So um, how are some of those, uh, how are some of those uh, research programs working and are we learning a little bit more about what maybe what can be done? Yeah. Um, yeah, we're learning all the time for sure. And, and the research that I do is kind of um, sits in this middle ground between the science and the management side of things. So trying to mitigate um, a lot of the impacts that are on, on marine mammals and, we've touched on it a couple of times and just to kind of, I guess, make it really, really clear when we're looking at two different types of whales, we're looking at baleen whales or so the, the big guys at like the humpbacks in the video um, that are typically mid to low frequency users of sound. Um, and then we've got like the dondocetes or the toothed whales, such as like Claire well behind me, um, that are usually mid to high frequency um, communicators. And so in terms of the, the frequencies that these animals use, they, they vary quite a lot. And in terms of their hearing sensitivity, as you can imagine, if they are the noises that they make themselves, that's the, the frequencies that they can also hear at. Um, and so when we look at kind of noise, like our seismics, you know, that you're just mentioning there and things, there's been quite a lot of advances in technology um, in terms of trying to mitigate the noise that actually goes out into the environment. So they, they use different things like um, bubble nets around where they're kind of, if they're pile driving and stuff, so it dissipates the noise. So it reduces the kind of blast radius, if you like, of how far that noise travels. The good thing about the high frequency noises as well is the distance over which um, the, the noise loses its energy is less. Um, when we look at low frequency noises, so the kinds that ships and big container ships are putting out, these are low frequency producers and, and those sounds can travel over, as you said, whole ocean basins. Um, and that's when we're really talking about this 18 hours, you know, for that kind of window for it to kind of um, be reduced significantly. Uh, and if you think about humpbacks and these animals, they mentioned kind of before that they were, we used to think that they were very solitary animals and um, we've got others like the blue whale and stuff and fin whales that we, we do know um, are for most of their lives do travel solo or occasionally kind of meet up. But if you think about that, you're, you're trying to find your mate over a huge big ocean basin, then it, they've evolved to produce low frequency noises in order to kind of try and find out where, where each other are because these noises go far. Um, so when you look at low frequency noise, such as shipping containers, that's a real concern to those bigger baleen whales. Um, when we look at, you know, the, the mid and high frequency noises, not to say that they, you know, that the lower frequencies don't impact our tooth whales as well, but when we were talking about echo sounders, you know, and those are overlapping in the exact frequency bands that echolocation clicks produced by our, our tooth whales are using. Um, so it's really important to have a kind of a grasp of those, these individual, um, how they all kind of align, um, the, the producers of the noise and the recipients of the noise and how it's important. Um, and then getting a handle on such things as the slowdown um, of vessels. It's not a linear relationship, and it used to be just even a couple of years ago, actually, like four or five years ago, as we used to think, well, if you slowed a vessel down, it was a linear relationship between the noise drop off. We now know that's not the case. It's an individual vessel by vessel basis. Um, and other, uh, other factors that come into play is if, um, if you're doing like gear changes or you're having to turn, that will increase your noise. And actually, a lot of engines are built to run at optimum speeds where they run quietest. Um, so it's not, it's not a one size fits all management scheme, um, but they, for sure, slowing down, keeping back, keeping a distance when you're on a special, a smaller boat, we know that definitely works in terms of reducing noise. Um, and, and obviously if you just remove the producer from an area, yeah. it's definitely going to reduce the noise. Uh, but how are you finding it out on the water? Uh, knowing what you know about the damage that could be caused uh, by these boaters, how are you finding the behavior of boaters and when you talk to them and, and address um, you know, their behavior and try to educate them? Um, and when we contact most people, they're generally very receptive to kind of the message uh, for conservation, you know, the plight of the southern residents, the orca whales that tend to be in this area more frequently. Is people are very receptive and they want to do something to help. And you know, slowing down and staying, you know, a few hundred yards back is something easy that they can do right then and there on the water with the whales. So you know, people are generally very receptive to it and want to 
um, know more about how they can help, and then that leads into you know the whole other slew of things you know that we can tell them about. Yeah, um, I, I have to ask a question of all three of you because it's been on my mind about sound. Last summer, we had this heartbreaking story that everybody was following on the West Coast here. Annie, I'm not sure if you picked it up, but we have a limited number of resident uh, whales here, and one of them died of starvation. And, and I guess there's a dynamic that, um, that you just see how they start thinning around their head. And uh, I guess the question that I had, uh, just thinking about this again, was, is the sound and the noise pollution, is it, is it causing the, these whales to starve because they can't find their food? Yeah, and so then, you know, that is the key question that everyone's been asking. And there's quite a few studies out there for, you know, what is the detection range of a killer whale to find a salmon? You know, how far can they do that? You know, what at what sound levels can they do that? Um, you know, and then there's these other studies, I wanted to mention it before with odontocetes that, you know, uh, you mentioned rock concerts. You know, there are these studies where odontocetes actually get TTS, which is temporary threshold shift, and it's the same thing that happens to you when you go to a rock concert or you hear a really loud noise for a long time. You wake up the next morning, you know, and you feel like you're yelling at your significant other or whatever because your ears actually had to adjust to that noise. So there is quite good evidence that this happens to the dentists and toothed whales um, that, you know, when there are kind of this high ambient noise or really high level um, events of noise that you know these whales their you know hearing range goes from this to this and when you know you echolocate in this range but then you have loud noises you can't you know echolocate anymore and you kind of you know get that feedback to finding your fish um, you know so it so it is a huge concern here especially just for the resident whales you know finding that fish and then catching it you know there also is kind of the other side of that is that it's not just acoustic disturbance there's presence disturbance you know it takes an orca whale two five eight minutes to catch a single salmon and in that time they can swim over a thousand yards so you know even though currently the vessel regulations are to say 200 yards away you know if they're chasing a fish you know they could get close to you and you know if you move your boat or if that noise you know, kind of give them a startle response, you know, they lose that fish after expending all this energy to chase it and to not get the nutritional benefit of actually catching the fish. So, you know, not to say that, you know, noise is the sole reason um, that the orca whales, at least here, are declining. It's, it's definitely a factor. It's kind of a one-two-punch compound effect with prey availability and contamination and then acoustic noise. Uh, any, uh, <laughs> is there anything that, uh, that you know, you've seen to support, um, you know, some of the damage um, that ocean noise pollution has caused whales? And we've just talked about food, but, you know, we talked about beachings earlier, but just exploring uh, a little bit about, you know, the evidence that this actually is a pollution for them. Another one, I don't know if you guys have heard of this one, is that they've, they've, um, recorded and noticed that blue whales will stop foraging when there's high levels of noise pollution in the area. Um, and again, that's just like an animal not being able to hunt and find its food because somebody in the room is being too loud. Like it, it's, yeah, that, that, that's another one. Okay. Sorry. I just, you know, I, I guess for the, the average boater, we see orca, we see whales and we see them, you know, hunting and uh, I had the privilege of, of with my daughter last uh, summer in the mountains watching um, some transients go after some, some uh, seals. And it was spectacular watching nature in action. And I was just thinking, my goodness, like, have I been helping, uh, have, have I been adding to the problem by just running my motors and they can't find their food? Yeah. And I think as, and as well, another really big thing, like you said, you're at, you can feel like you're adding to the problem. It's like whale watching. Whale watching is such a catch 22 in the fact that, it's fantastic to show people these animals and ecotourism has proven to be significantly effective, especially in reducing things like, for example, not with whales necessarily, but poaching in Africa. They found that showing people these species helps educate them about it and it makes people want to protect the species more. And ecotourism with whale watching is really tricky because obviously the areas where you get most efficient whale watching is where these animals probably rely on these 
environments and these habitats more. For example, where I was filming in um, Iceland was Skalfandi Bay, where it's the feeding ground for, or, uh, for humpbacks. So they've gone on these thousand mile long migrations to go to areas where they need to feed. And then they're going into this tiny bay where there's at any one time, sometimes 13 whale watching boats surrounding them whilst they're trying to feed and communicate with one another. after They've been on possibly solitary migrations of, or with calves. There was one um, mother and baby up there. And to think there's um, boats pushing in between these um, individuals. Um, and also, yeah, for then humpbacks that are then in their breeding grounds where they need to sing and, and to communicate to one another to be able to mate efficiently. And if a mother's just had a calf that needs to, they need to stay close because within minutes in an ocean swell, they can be separated and can't find one another again. And yeah, to know that you're adding to the problem sometimes is really tough. You don't want to limit people's chances to explore the natural world and to explore oceans and and to go out on boats you know it's to say to all you uh, to all uh, recreational boaters that they can't do it anymore and that is just a part of the problem it's kind of education it's making people understand it's a thing in the first place and then being able to like act on it and to enforce legis legislation i mean it's fantastic to hear about everything that you guys are doing because it's so hard to keep to keep up with everything especially here where cetaceans aren't on the coast if i go down to uh western supermare sadly i can't see that we do get them every now and again orcas pop up um quite frequently around but i can't go down to clevedon and see it and that's another reason again why the film is so important was so important to make is kind of bringing it back home to people to realize that everybody has an impact on this just like everyone's got an impact on icebergs melting and plastic pollution. And it was something that we're very far, especially where I was brought up in Leicester, very, very far from the ocean. You can think that you're having no effect on noise pollution, but I think it's just important to bring home the fact that when things are shipped over, um, when you when you buy things from overseas, for example, or just lots of things in your life are having effect on this noise pollution. So that was, yeah, you can't stop everything instantly i know with the if we stopped all human activities and in 18 hours it would be silent and i get that that is probably impossible to do anytime soon but i think just making people aware and giving them an empowering message as well at the end um was important anything um taylor just uh, first to you and then lauren we'll get to you just to wrap some things up with the governments and some other comments yeah i just wanted to touch on kind of your question as well as you know I'm a boat on the water that makes noise. And as a researcher, you know, like I struggle with the, you know, fact that, you know, I am a part of the problem in a way is because I'm a boat on the water, um, you know, making noise. And, you know, you mentioned J50 was the orca whale that we lost due to probably starvation, um, you know, this past summer. And there was actually a day um, on the water where we were trying to deliver antibiotics to her and uh, it was kind of a tough day and we weren't we we didn't get it delivered and you know we had to get close to the to the group of whales to be able to deliver the medicine um, but you know they kind of just weren't having it and you know it had to come down to the point where we had to tell ourselves we have to stand down because of our impacts that were I mean we're boat getting close to them you know even though we're trying to deliver medication like they barely weren't having it so we had to step back and then kind of to just also touch on um, you know, there are, you know, lots of things that everyone can do. You know, I always kind of get that question, you know, like, oh, you know, I live in, inland, you know, I, I don't have any effect on the ocean. And I'm like, no, you don't. You have all the effect in the world. And, you know, here are the different things. And, you know, kind of we've talked about um, noise, obviously, a lot. And, you know, this is very United States focused. But, you know, the current administration has decided to open up um, oil drilling in basically all of the United States federal waters. Um, so, you know, that is going to go to public comment probably here in March and is going to be uh, voted on in the Department of Interior. So as a private public citizen of any state, you can give public comment and call your representative and call anyone you can and be like, this is ridiculous. You're going to have to be seismic testing, whales, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, there are things that anyone can do, you know, to help whales, even if you don't live on the coast. Taylor, I'm glad you said that because I, I agree. There's so many things we can do, even though we're not even boat owners. 
<coughs> before I lose my voice, Lauren, over to you, just governments, what's being done at that level? Um, yeah, so a lot of the research I do is actually kind of government sponsored or involved with government researchers as well. Um, and here in Canada, um, especially in terms of the, the shipping and vessel traffic and reducing noise there, um, they're arguably, you know, ahead of the curve in terms of what, what's being done. Um, and there's also Southern Resident Killer Whales, which have come up multiple times um, today in terms of the the policy and the legislation behind them. They're probably the most arguably probably the most protected thing currently in our local area in the ocean. Um, and so in terms of the law behind them, it's 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 really starting to well, very, <laughs> any legal stuff is very slow in coming forward. Um, but it is really driving um, the necessity for governments to actually um, focus efforts in on, on noise as a factor. Um, and across the world, when you look at the policy behind it, um, in Europe, it's been kind of treated one way, in the States it's another. Um, it's, it's now been recognised in policy, but that takes a long time to trickle, actually trickle down to the management level. Um, things like MPAs and stuff, you know, which are some marine protected areas, are, are used on a global scale. Um, and the problem with noise is when you try to manage it spatially, like in an area, so if you, you slap an MPA on something, the activity doesn't necessarily need to be taking place in that area for the noise to actually permeate into that area. Um, so the, the development of different tools to tackle different types of noise pollution, as we, you know, we've mentioned from the seismic surveys and um, the pile driving stuff, you know, there is actually a, because it's been recognized for a longer period of time, there's more policy there um, about specific management of those activities. And, and there's definitely, it's an easier thing actually to, to tackle than, than the more chronic noise. Um, and that's something that's still very much evolving because if you think about it, especially with international shipping, those vessels are traversing multiple um, jurisdictions. And because of that, it has to become through the IMO, which is International Maritime Organization. And then that requires a champion. And that means a government, you know, and we all know what it's like you know somebody's got to invest money in this and time and effort and well you should do that no you should do that no you should do that that's a really good idea you know that goes on a lot um <laughs> but you know for people to actually take the lead on these things it, it requires investment and time and and finances um and that's often when there are more prevalent things um going on can be overlooked you know the immediate threats of oil spills and and plastic pollution sometimes are, are kind of being put to the forefront and we have this very reactionary approach and again globally in terms of management we tend to deal with something once the problem presents so if we have a mass stranding all of a sudden you know <laughs> we, we have to act on that but it's already happened and, and this is this um i think there's a real push from between behind scientists and managers that we should be more proactive in our approaches um, from a government level and that's something definitely that's starting to happen now in canada um we're, we're under I guess a different government um, in recent years there has been more um, long-term strategies starting to be put into play under the ocean protection plan which is rolling out um, over a longer period of time to try and introduce some measures that will hopefully be there for the future. I have a question uh, from Graham from Nanaimo. He says, I fish the strait in my Grady 28 and frequently come across killer whales. Should I turn off my fish finder and depth uh, sounder when near the whales? That is a great question. Um, you know, that's something that we've kind of just, um, you know, picked up in our research is that um, you know, it's pretty obvious that depth sounders and fish finders operate in the same frequencies that um, killer whales use their echolocation. So yeah, it's definitely a recommendation that people turn off their fish finders or depth sounders, you know, when they're within a kilometer, half mile of the whales, you know, it's something that Washington State tried to kind of put into the legislature to see if, um, uh, to see if we could make it a law. And, and, you know, it's kind of difficult. I honestly don't know how to turn off the depth sounder um, on our research boat besides flicking the battery switch. Um, so I actually never really use it anyways, but there are um, lots of, you kind of have to like figure it out for your own boat. I know some people, it's even like a plug in the back of the GPS and the only way to turn it off is to unplug it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something that people are definitely working on and we've even started to talk to manufacturers about having an option to switch it off or to switch between high and low frequency. My next question is from Sunny in Richmond and um, 
he asks, can mammals adapt to the noise in the ocean? For example, can they change to a different frequency that allows them to communicate or is the noise too loud? The evidence is there in terms of science, but what's really interesting is it, it really seems to depend not only on the species that we're talking about in terms of how they cope and adapt, um, but it depends on individual populations. So even across um, dolphin populations, they seem to have kind of come up with a variety of coping strategies, which should be no great, no great surprise because, you know, when you look at how amazing they are in terms of um, their foraging and behavioral differences, you know, and, and how they overcome various things in different regions. Um, in terms of ingenuity, the marine mammals are constantly showing us how ingenious they can be. Um, so some of the ways that they do this, they increase the energy in the calls. So they, they essentially make the calls kind of louder. Some of them change the frequency of their calls. So sometimes they're using different frequency bands to kind of compensate and be heard over, over certain noise. Something we didn't really talk about today is masking and it's exactly what it sounds like. You know, it's when you're in a busy restaurant, you're trying to talk to somebody, they can't hear you because everybody else is talking at the same um, sound levels and, and frequency levels as you are. And so, you know, you've got to talk louder. They essentially are doing the same sort of thing. And the worrying thing is that in here in BC, there's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that Unfortunately, our southern residents, they decided to use the coping mechanism of the, the uh, stopping vocalising until it gets quieter um, is their kind of chosen technique. And of course, all the time that they, they're not, they're not vocalising, they're not communicating with each other, they're not foraging, um, you know, and starvation is a real big issue here. And so any time, you know, this is going again back to what Taylor was talking about um, earlier, any time that they are not spending actively foraging and looking for food, is a, it's potentially has a really disproportionate impact on whales such as the southern residents that are currently really struggling um, to find enough to eat. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I actually have to draw an analogy. I'm a parent and um, I can imagine that if I'm in a very loud crowd and I have my three-year-old with me and I'm unable to communicate with him, he could get lost very quickly um, he could find himself in really dangerous situations. Um, there could be any number of things that could happen that would impede his ability to stay safe and, and to, you know, have that care. And so, you know, you think of a, a calf and, you know, his, his mother in the water, um, and what kind of impact that could also have, right? That, that noise, even as a human being, I find it overwhelming. So in water, I can imagine that that could be pretty, uh, a huge concern right for, for yeah and there's actually a really neat study that came out i think it was like a year year and a half ago now um down in australian waters and they, they put suction cups in the backs of humpback whales and they found you know that in terms of mums and calves they make these kind of very quiet grunty noises to kind of um keep that kind of presence between mum and calf um maintained but the thing is when you introduce all that background noise in order to be heard they have to grunt a bit louder you know and they essentially then they make themselves more visible to predators when you've got transient killer whales that are using their ears to hunt and you don't want to alert yourself uh, or the fact that you have a young calf with you to those animals um so it can have knock-on uh, effects as well that are not just as straight up as you know losing individuals and they can they can make you vulnerable to predation as well right thank yeah. you so much for that um last question uh, and this is going to be for annie um you know you your documentary is so fascinating and amazing. Um, uh, just hearing those sounds um, that many of the, these uh, mammals make in the water are really moving. Um, Allison from Victoria says, you know, if the noise from boats is so disturbing, then why do whales come so close to boats? And of course, you had to get close, right, to some of these, these, um, these mammals in the water. So can you tell us a little bit about why? Why do they creep closer? I think for most of it is the fact that they're in these areas which they have to behave. As I was saying earlier when we were filming in Iceland, um, that they have to feed. They've travelled so far and they're in these areas because they, they're high in nutrients, which means that the fish that they can feed on is, is um, in high d d populations and they can feed really efficiently there. So mm -hmm. they have to come around you and they, they move closer. And as Taylor was saying, they move so fast and try and cover distances so quickly that often a, a boat in the water isn't going to stop them from chasing a fish and, and hunting. Um, I've, I've been to um, Mexico where it's, there's the grey whales that they call the friendlies where they actually bring their 
their calves to the boats um, for them to come and they, people stroke them and compete these grey whales, which is in, crazy because actually only 30 years ago they were still hunting these species. So the individuals, the adults that are bringing their calves to boats have probably seen other members of their species being um, hunted. So it's kind of bizarre now to think why they still bring their infants to the boat. Um, curiosity, they're like, whales are incredibly complex animals and I think so often we underestimate their intelligence and their, their social demands and, and how much they, you know, you see the higher the hierarchies within the orca whales, for example, and we can't ever contemplate the, the idea that another species, apart from our own, has those social interactions. So just the same as we go and look at these animals it's weird that we're then shocked they come and um, investigate us and are curious about us because they're curious and incredibly intelligent animals. Um, but I think quite often they have to put up with the noise. And as Lauren was saying, there's, you know, they've seen the changing frequencies to dodge the noise and that's really sad. And, and hopefully these animals can evolve quick enough to prevent starvation, but we've got to, yeah, we've got to think about that because they, they might not be able to evolve quick enough. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much, everybody. Uh, we're running um, a little bit uh, uh, behind, but uh, it's been valuable. And if there's any questions that came through that uh, we didn't get to, uh, we will reply back um, with an email. For each of the panelists, um, uh, we are going to be providing links to, uh, to be able to contact you. So for your work and for um, uh, the different organizations you're involved in. So if they want to reach out uh, to you, they know where to find you. That will be linked uh, in the email that goes out as well as a video that will be recorded uh, for this event for the people that couldn't attend. I am so thankful that we have people like yourselves who are involved in different aspects from educators to practitioners, people who are protecting us in the water. Um, those of you who participated as attendees shows the interest levels. And uh, again, as I said at the beginning, if this type of format uh, just allows us to just learn a little bit more so that we can do our little part and inspire other people. That would be wonderful. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you.